Hello, I'm Adam Grimes, and this is going to be a brief presentation on seasonality. I want to share some of the work that I have done on seasonality with you, and to try to help you build an appreciation for, and maybe even some intuition, about the kind of randomness that we see in seasonal data. And this will explain to you why I don't put any weight on seasonality in most of my analysis and work. And speaking of seasonality, it's a nice time of the year, and I'm recording this with the window open, so I apologize for background noise, dogs, and street noise that you might happen to hear. Um, also, if I don't know where you found this video, but you can find more of my work. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Adam H. Grimes, or you can also check out my blog, www.adamhgrimes.com, where I share more information and ideas like this. So take a moment here to think. This is going to be a presentation you have to think about a little bit. So what I have done is I've created a system that will generate random price data. And I I'm able to specify the trend of that data, which is the drift component up here, and also the variation or the amount of noise, if you will, the amount of jitter in the data, which is the standard deviation, which is set very close to zero right now. Um, and then I am also able to go through, and for each of the months of the year, and this is randomly generated data, but it, I, I did attach those the data to actual dates. Uh, for each month of the year, I'm able to introduce a known seasonal bias. So I'll go through here and let's just say in March, I will introduce a 10% bias and just for fun in September, a negative 10% bias. Now what these numbers mean is they're annualized. So it's a 10% annualized bias, meaning that each trading day of month three, if it has been increased an average of the amount that if the market traded that for an entire year would put the market up 10% at the end of the year. And again, these are randomly generated price bars, but at this point, there's no noise in it. There's no variation. So you can see if you look down at the bottom, here's what the data would look like. A very odd price chart. But you can still see the increase in month three and the very dependable decrease in month nine. And I'll use month numbers instead of names here, I guess. Um, and then I also have two different ways of looking at seasonality. On the right is kind of the typical what's called the link relative method. Uh, it's there for your comparison. But on the left is the method that I would tend to use, which looks at, it's simply the average return by month minus the baseline return of the market. And it's broken out in both cases. You can't see on the link relative because it's on top right now. You will see it separate in a moment, but there is a set of maroon data that's the full 11 years beginning 2000 to 2010. We're going to look at actual market data in a moment but just for the random data it has the same dates and then in this case we're looking at the last three years for the blue data so you can see where there's if, if there's any variation. So you can see that as I've introduced that positive bias into month three, you see my system reliably pulls that out and the negative bias in month nine. If I introduce another bias, you see it's also here. Um, and you can see the bias in month five now. I'll go ahead and back that out just, just to keep things simple. So this is with no trend to the data. And I'm guessing it increases because there are more trading days in month three than month nine. Um, but if I introduce, say, a 5% drift, you can see now the market tends to go up very reliably. And you can see the it's been no change to the seasonal analysis, which automatically backs out that trend. And there's a 5% trend down. And this looks like, you know, looking at this market data, this is very odd. We don't see market data just trend like this. So let's introduce a little bit of variation. This is a one degree standard deviation. And one, sorry, 1% standard deviation. And just for comparison, that would be like a VIX of 1%. So it's a VIX of a, you know, unimaginably low number, if you will. And now each time I regenerate the sheet, I generate a different set of data. However, each set still has that reliable seasonal distortion in months three and nine. And you notice here with the low standard deviation, uh, we, we're still very reliably pulling out that month three and month nine. You can see that here. However, 
it's something to think about. So if you look at a lot of seasonal work that people do, you know, do we have a reliable weakness here at month 10, 11, and 12? Is there a reliable strength in month 6? Well, it's interesting because that strength in month 6 appears both in the longer data set and in the shorter data set as a slight weakness in month 2. Now, these are just random fluctuations in the data. They do not actually exist. We know how we've put our thumb on the scale and weighted month 3 positive, month 9 negative. Uh, keep in mind this is a very low standard deviation. Let me increase it just a little bit. This is still quite low. Uh, this is, in, just for comparison, this would be the equivalent of the market going up 5% a year, which is within the realm of possibility, with a 2% VIX, which is not at all realistic. VIX is much, much higher. Even at these very low levels of noise, Look how distorted the seasonal analysis becomes. Now again, we know the seasonal distortion. There's a 10% positive bias in month 3, negative 10% in month 9. Uh, in the short sample here, we don't really tease out the month 3. We do in the longer data set. Let me take another random generation. So now look, it seems like we have some kind of positive distortion in month 6 and negative in 7, 8, 9. Let me increase the standard deviation even more. Here is 10%. We're approaching what might be realistic levels of volatility in the market, though it's still quite low. And just, I'll keep generating random data sets here as I talk. Uh, here you have a very strong positive in month 8, negative in 5 and 6, and that is just by the random luck of the draw. Uh, let me crank VIX up to somewhere that would be realistic, let's say 18%. And now look, the known bias for month three is totally hidden in the data. And now we have a very clear bias in month 12 that's not actually there. And so you see, I hope that as you see the degree of randomness increases in the market, the degree of what we would appear to be seasonal nuance it also increases. And this is all, just to put it in plain English, garbage. This is all random noise that is just statistical fluctuation. This is not actually a seasonal tendency that exists. Again, we know the seasonal tendency, which is for positive 10% month 3 and negative 10% month 9. I'm sorry to repeat myself so much, but the point is if you look at the screen here, uh, do you see month 3? No, now we see month 2. Do you see the negative in month 9? No, we see quite the opposite. Um, so... Let me pause this for a second and I'm going to pull up some real market data. Okay, so now your screen has changed a little bit and this is calculated from the S&P from 2000 to the end of 2010. We have a standard deviation during that period of almost 21%. So we were in the ballpark with the 18% and a baseline drift of only 1.5%. Over longer time periods, the baseline return in stocks is a little bit higher, but just because I picked, basically I ended up picking the peak of the 2000 market nearly and that's artificially depressed. However, you could have invested at that point. The um, blue bars will show the last three years of data which are highlighted here in yellow and this is the seasonal tendency for the longer period of the market. So let's look at the seasonality. We see here that October, people will tell you October is the best month of the market. Well, so look what we have, and you can see the actual numbers over here. We have a 25% positive bias in October, but is that truly statistically higher than 21 and 20% in uh, February and March? Um, we know there is a January effect, which we actually, don't, which is for positive returns in January, which we actually don't see here. And we know the end of the year tends to be a positive period. At least this is what we, uh, you know, the received wisdom, and we don't actually see that in this data at all. How However, um, if you will remember the lesson of the randomly generated data, this could very well all be random. Let's take, I'm going to now change the blue bars from, that was 2007 to 2010. Now let's make it 2004 to 2007 and just compare a very different, I'll set it back, watch the blue bars, a very different set of seasonal tendencies. And if the, look at, 
pay particular attention to month nine, which is September, the famous weak month of the market. Um, and if you see in these different slices, very different impact, right? Um, and let's go back to a yet another slice here. This is 2001 to 2004 for the blue bars and the red bars, of course, are the whole data set are unchanging. And here again, the uh, week September did not appear in 2001. Let me make 2001 through 2007. Uh, you know, the September is not noticeably weaker. So, and the point is, of course, that all of this, anytime anybody goes through and tells you that a month is the weakest or the strongest or a week is a turning point or people will generate uh, you know price paths that will say the market should turn at this date or at this point statistically turns uh, if you have an appreciation for the kind of noise we see then all of that analysis is highly questionable to say the least so you know you certainly can use it and perhaps some people do extract value but I think if you are going to use it you have to have an appreciation for the degree of noise that's in the data and um, you know based on my work pretty much everything we see in seasonality with very few exceptions but particularly in stocks is explainable by random variation which means you cannot and should not use it as motivation for trades or investment ideas. So that's all I have here. Again, if you have any questions, you can reach me at my blog, www.adamhgrimes.com. And please do check out my blog and follow me on Twitter at Adam H. Grimes. Thank you very much.